yeah, thank you very much. So I'm, I'm a lawyer, uh, happy to be here. Um, are there any lawyers in the room? Excellent. Excellent. Well, good enough. Why? Why? <laughs> I just missed the exam. Hmm? I missed the exam. Ah, okay. But, but you bounce back. Very good. Um, so I, uh, as Alexander said, I, um, I work in the legal tech space, broadly speaking. Um, I had a traditional career as my uh, for six years, um, and then I founded the legal tech startup, um, which did not work out. But I remained entrenched in in that space, and I also um, I did reach out to. Um, does the mic work? Yes. Yeah. Um, I did reach out to the uh, to the Pi Data community in Berlin. Uh, and that's eventually how we uh, how we met, which is quite odd that being in Frankfurt, it took the detour of me going to Berlin to link with the community and then meet people from Mannheim to start working with them. But but I think that's how the well works, and I think that's a good good example. Um, so I will talk to you about um, NLP in. In a legal context, so what's NLP? Natural language processing. I think for you people, I don't need to <laughs> explain that. For lawyers, uh, NLP could be something completely different. Um, they would probably think it's it's NPL, which is non-performing loans. Um, so, <laughs> um, so NLP in a legal context. Um, so what does it mean? Um, I think for for the purpose of this talk, which is also time boxed. Uh, we can forget about um, robo lawyers and, and robo judges. Um, of course, the um, the desire for things like that has been large. I think people, if people can get rid of lawyers, they they will be quite open minded um, about the opportunity. And I think that's so. That's why these topics are are sexy to a certain extent. They also. Um, link to what Larissa talked about, right, to ethical questions in terms of is suddenly um, a lawyer or especially a judge or, um, or an administrative agency um, is replaced by um, a machine. Um, there are a lot of implications uh, in, in that space. So, but for my part and for the people that I talk to, I can safely say uh, we're not there yet. Um, and the more realistic challenges that, that are suitable for, for NLP in, in the legal context are um, the ones I've listed there, which are compliance, due diligence, and discovery. Um, compliance is a large topic in law, probably the one that you are, um, that you are familiar with if you work in a company. Um, it, it's being compliant with applicable laws and regulations. And that can mean a lot of things. It can be anti-money laundering, it can be um, data protection rules, um, it can be um, domain-specific or industry-specific rules like health regulations, um, all of these things. It does involve, usually it does involve a large, larger amount of data. Legal problems often involve very small amounts of data. If you have a question about your lease contract, you approach your lawyer with one lease contract. If your lawyer would try to be a data scientist and say, well, I'll build a model with lease contracts, he might find six. Um, now, you tell me whether that is a suitable model to build, to build something that can say your lease contract is valid or not valid, or there are these, these problems in your lease contract. So compliance is one, one of the areas where, where a lot of people feel um, some, some things can work. Another one is due diligence. If you're not fully familiar with the term, that's, that's the thing you do to check whether the thing that you buy is what you want to buy. Um, and it is most relevant in the context of buying companies. Because a company, right, you cannot look at it. If you buy Siemens, you, you're not going to, to the Siemens building. You look at it, you think it's OK. You buy it, but rather you have to check everything that Siemens does on the planet. Um, and part of the due diligence is always legal due diligence. That means you go through the documents and you check, you check, you check are there any legal problems, are there any legal issues in there. So that, that could be what 
translates to you as anomaly detection, for example, or the extraction of relevant data. Um, it could involve just trying to figure out what are the kinds of documents that we are working with, what are maybe jurisdictions that we're working with. Because for lawyers, the jurisdiction of a document can be very relevant um, because you have to choose which lawyer you want to work with, right? If you put a German lawyer on an Italian law problem, um, you're not spending your money wisely. Probably you will also simply refuse and say that's not, that's not my jurisdiction. Um, so that can be quite interesting. And, and to make that maybe a little bit more, um, to elaborate on that, what used to happen in these cases was that people would build physical data rooms i.e. the companies would start putting paper into files and they would put it in a room somewhere and the lawyers would go there by train or by plane, live in a hotel close by and every day at some point someone would open the room, the lawyers would go in and would and start reading the documents, taking physical notes and then they were not allowed to take the files with them so they had to read them, they had to understand what's in there, they had to take notes. Sometimes they were not allowed to take notes, and then it would go back. And then uh, there would be 40 lawyers or so, or 50, depending on, on how large that exercise was. So, so already one, one, one major evolution was digital data rooms. Um, for lawyers, it was a little bit disappointing because that meant there were no more trips, right? The, in the past, due diligence was at least, well, we're going to Rome, or we're going to Rio de Janeiro. Now it's, well, we have Rio de Janeiro documents, but you're sitting at home or in the firm um, looking, at it, looking at a computer screen. But it did save a lot of money already. Um, and now, of course, the idea is, well, if we have that in a data room, why are we not doing something with data science? Or why are, can, we, can we start analyzing these documents using, using modern technologies, such as natural language processing? Discovery is what you do in court cases where if you sue the Siemens and you're not sure you have all the evidence, if your case is at a certain level, Siemens might be obligated or ordered by the court to provide you with the document. And that's uh, it's especially, it's especially common in the US and that's also why the US um, Tools are the most advanced because what the US lawyers came up with in terms of, well, we have to show you documents. We also, it's, they have to show all the relevant documents. So if someone's suing you, for example, for putting poison in the water, technically, once the judge orders them to deliver all the relevant documents, you have to send them the documents where the CEO says, put that poison in the water, I don't care who dies. Of course, you don't want to give that paper to the other side, but you also don't want to make yourself criminally liable for, for withholding that paper from the court. So what they started doing was that they were sending so much paper, hoping that people would not find the one piece of relevant information. So I'm guessing if I was asking you what, we, what would be your dream scenario to do some training, would be someone taking one relevant piece and putting it in as large a pile of possibly not relevant pieces. So that's why, why discovery is one of the parts where, where these tools are being used. The, the other aspect is can we, and what we're desperately trying to do is can we find other areas where we have a lot of documents coming in that are kind of of legal nature um, so we can use similar techniques or start training or, or trying to figure out what works and what, what doesn't. Um, so you see a lot of these um, consumer legal techs um, trying to use these techniques. So for example, um, your flight rights, um, your, um, your upman thing, so file sharing, uh, whatever, whatever area you have where a lot of consumers are being sued or are being sent papers, and you as a provider could say, well, give me all of your papers, and I will try to figure out how to answer your question. Uh, the problem there is if you offer that service but you don't have the tool to do it yet, you need to do it yourself. And that's why not everyone is, is doing it. Yeah. Um, 
something that's very relevant for lawyers is, is kind of the evolution that has happened in that space. So um, there were waves of we can replace lawyers with technology already. Um, the old one was called Rechtsinformatik, i.e. Uh, information technology in law. Um, and that was, there the approach was the old one. So can we kind of look into the heads of the lawyers and try to rule-based or decision tree-based or whatever it is, but, but, but kind of repro reproduce the way a lawyer say things, find the smartest lawyer, understand how he works, and just build something that works the same way. Um, it didn't work. I think the more prominent example of that not working is IBM Watson. Um, IB, but IBM Watson actually was something that, were, that was branching out into the legal world, where a lot of lawyers worked with IBM on trying to figure out how IBM Watson could do legal work. Um, in my firm, they cooperated with IBM on that, and I think it was probably five to six years ago where they showed us a presentation of IBM Watson and said, this thing is now as smart as a legal trainee, so you'll be gone by in about two to three years, right? When this thing finishes university, so to speak. Um, fortunately, it, it, <laughs> it did not develop that way. But this is, but this is where, where we were in the past. Um, another example I think that, that, that illustrates well is Google Translator. Um, which was kind of um, um, kind of put in the shadows by DeepL, and the interesting bit about DeepL and using new technology is DeepL, as far as I know, started as a translation tool, but giving context where you could start typing in sentences and it would translate the full sentence rather than giving you piece by piece words, um, and what they did is they took the internet. Um, and what was the, the translation assistant that they used, does anyone know? Wikipedia. Who did their work for them? Wikipedia? No. Legal documents? Hmm? Legal documents? Yes. From, from which institution, do you know? European Union. The European Union. So essentially, when you, when you use that tool and you started typing in, it would always show you where it got its ideas from. And the, the top five hits usually would be translations within the European Union, because we, we probably wasted a lot of money on that. But, but we did create a lot of data in terms of translating things into 28 languages or more. Yeah? And, but, but you were right. Those were a lot of legal texts, which funnily enough means that when we lawyers use DeepL, it's quite accurate because it has, it has that lingo of legal documents and this, this European Union Commission speech. It does understand that very well. So, so you, you see how that technology is now more suitable to do legal work. Because when you do legal work, the first thing you need to do is you need to understand language. So one of the major barriers has dropped now. The other one, however, is that, that a lot of this data structure stuff that you have to do to do the work that you do is, is even more complicated in the legal world. So you, you, you building all of that, identifying where's our data coming from? Is it coming from CRMs? Is it coming from ERPs, i.e., what are people doing in the company? That would be your anti-money laundering monitor stuff. Is it, is it external sources, such as data rules, or is it operations? Is it, is it companies? Is it factories? Um, are there APIs? Usually there are no APIs. Um, so all of that makes it, makes it super difficult. Um, and what happens a lot is that people are now trying to work on the infrastructure rather than the advanced models. Because the models are usually there, but the infrastructure to get the data to the model is not there. And there's, as far as I know, there's not a lot of experimentation going on because we, we have very limited data sets. And if someone has a data set, they're not making it open source. They're not publishing it. They're keeping it to themselves. Uh, so whoever, whoever would, 
would be willing to work on that. Um, I think every, every open source minded lawyer would be uh, very grateful. Um, so, so what happens now, and I talked to a couple of people over the, the, the last couple of days in, in, uh, in anticipation of this talk, um, there is kind of a toolkit approach in the legal space. So you would have to look at your, if you're, for example, a company that wants to do more legal work with tech um, or a law firm, you have to look at your, your structures, right? Where, where are our gaps? Are we digital at all, or are we still using fax machines? Are the partners still putting stuff on paper, and then it's an image scan? Um, or are we actually digital? Um, and other things. What are, what are the tools that we're using? How are we pushing data through the firm or through, through a company? Um, so a lot of the homework is, do we have a data infrastructure or do we not have it? Um, what are our workflows? Um, what is the know-how and the skills? So you can imagine lawyers, not the most advanced tech people on the planet. Um, we were skeptical about email until very, very recently. Um, we, we are moving off of fax machines slowly but surely. Um, we have our own secure mailing system which cost as much as it cost to build Google in the first place. And it didn't work when, when, when we started out, so there was a lot of frustration within the legal community about that. Um, the usability is a bit problematic. It requires you to buy a card reader um, to get a card issued by the notary chamber to pay 50 euros a year for that and then to get into your mailbox you have to put that card into the card reader you have to know your pin you have to download a client to 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 work with the card reader I when I first started that I, I told a friend I think I can now also launch nuclear weapons because that <laughs> system cannot be more complicated than than this. But, but that, that, that's the fun part when you do that. You feel very important because you have this card reader, you plug it in, you plug the card, you start the client server, it does some Java things. Um, you have to, I think, start a lot of things that are not necessarily secure, but, but your, your mailbox is secure. So, so that's something where, where lawyers have a lot of problems. Um, now we've learned working with that, now we have to start understanding SharePoint and things like that, so, so it's really difficult for us. Um, and then you look, at, you look at the toolkits that you have in the legal space, which I think can be interesting in terms of linking up the different communities. Um, there's some legal operations stuff, there's some legal outsourcing stuff, so do you still need to use lawyers for all of that work? Probably not. Um, you have workflow and automation tools, so you start linking up things like contract generation, right, rather than teaching a model how to write a contract. In most of the cases, the contracts, you can start building a contract in a modular way and use more simple tools um, that essentially are then also a little bit more decision tree wise to build, to build solutions that ask people questions and then the contract comes out and that's more an expert system approach. But at some point then the question is, do you want to build your own legal NLP or are you using one, the most prominent one being Kira, and they are, they're a good example. They're from the United States. I think they're trained a lot on, on the data that is available in the United States, and they are delivering decent results. Um, and, but they are the only ones, I think, who are delivering actually these decent results. Um, and in the German space, of course, you have the problem of retraining that software to understand German language legal documents. So I hope that gives you a little bit of an understanding of what's happening in that um, space. If, uh, if you are interested in that, I would be happy to talk to you um, about it because I think it's, it's really necessary um, to push that forward. Uh, if, if you want, if in the end you want a, a legal um, NLP lawyer uh, instead of your physical one. Okay, thank you very much.